adjective global seems to be attached to almost every history these days. We find publications on the global history of the Communist Party, the global history of architecture, the global history of aesthetic education, the global history of cotton, the global history of cotton, the global history of chocolate. <laughs> When we think about the global history of cities then, the first question that might come to mind is, is global urban history simply a new trend? Is it just a recent fad, a kind of fashion among historians these days? There certainly is a growing number of publications and conferences that carry this title, or this term in their title. Now here's one example from a special issue of the Journal of Urban History that was published in fall of last year, entitled The Making of Music Venues Inquiries into Global Urban History. It was edited by Cornelia Escher and Martin Rempe. Also last year, in July, to provide another example, the Center for Urban History at the University of Leicester and uh, Simon Young is with us here today, um, together with the Global Urban History Project, organized a conference with the title, The Pursuit of Global Urban History. This conference brought together around 100 historians who share an interest in the emerging field of global urban history. In his insightful conference report for the Journal of Urban History, Alistair Keffer noted that one of the central themes of the conference was the question, what constitutes a global urban history? Now this is precisely the question that I want to focus on in my talk today. And the title of my talk is Global urban history, but it might as well be, what is global urban history? We could start with a very, very short definition. We could start by saying that global urban history is a history of cities beyond a single urban or national setting that is conscious of questions of Eurocentrism, synchronicity, and global integration. Now, while I do believe that this definition, definition reflects the most important qualities of global urban history, I do have to admit that it is an awfully long-winded sentence that might actually raise more questions than answers. In my talk, I want to unpack this definition. Over the next 35 minutes or so, I will provide a more detailed answer to the question, what is global urban history? And I want to do so in three steps. I will start with uh, what I call points of departure, um, namely approaches that global urban history can build on. I will then move on in the second part to the specificity of global urban history. That is, what makes global urban history distinct from other approaches. And then in the third part, I want to talk about an example, namely the history of suburbs as an example for a global urban history. So let me begin with the points of departure. <coughs> To be sure, global urban history is not entirely new. There are several approaches that it can build on. They all share the characteristic of going beyond individual case studies and a single national context. I see at least three approaches that global urban history expands on. Comparative urban history, transnational urban history, and an approach that we could call cities in world. Let me begin with, begin with comparative urban history. Comparative studies in many ways stand at the beginning of urban sociology. 
Max Weber's argument about the European city were famously based on civilizational comparisons. In Weber's work, the specificities of Europe's urban past, such as the emergence of municipal structures, becomes clear once they are contrasted to cities in other world regions, such as China or the Middle East. In a recent publication, Nicholas Kenny and Rebecca Metkin have eloquently drawn attention to the fact that our observations about cities are always informed by comparison. And here I quote from their publication. Our knowledge of and relationship to a given city inherently depends on our appreciation of other cities, end of quote. So in that sense, we can say that urban history, whether explicitly or implicitly, always is a comparative exercise. What characterizes classic comparative studies in urban history is that they compare a circumscribed phenomenon in two or more cities to identify similarities and differences. A frequent aim behind such comparisons is the establishment of a typology of cities. A prominent example in this context are comparisons between port cities. Robert Lee, for instance, suggested a comparison between socioeconomic and demographic characteristics of port cities to test the coherence of the type of the port city in an article in 1998. As such comparisons can potentially include cities around the world, comparative urban history clearly speaks to a global urban history. Different authors have suggested, for instance, a comparative history of port cities as a promise, promising avenue for combining global and urban history. Transnational urban history. Transnational urban history is a second approach that relates to global urban history. In recent years, this subfield has seen sustained conceptual discussions. A number of edited volumes in particular have addressed the question of how to combine the so-called transnational term in historiography with urban history. <coughs> and here are just three um, prominent examples that I want to highlight. A pivotal and early contribution in this respect was the volume, Another Global City, Historical Explorations, Explorations into the Transnational, Transnational Municipal Moment, 1850-2000, edited by Pierre-Yves Saunier and Shane Ewan in 2008. This is on the far left. It's a bit hard to read since it's written in white. Um, more recent volumes include Cities Beyond Borders, this is the volume in the middle, which was edited by Nicholas Kenny and Rebecca Matkin in 2015, and the quote that I just referred to uh, comes from this volume. And a third example on the far right um, is Making Cities Global, the Transnational Turn in Urban History, which was edited by Andrew Sandoval Strauss and Nancy Kwok. The contributions in these volumes often focus on transfers in the fields of urban planning and governance. In this way, historians have followed, for instance, specific policies or regulations across different countries or even around the globe. I think a, a prominent and very good example for this uh, is Carl Nightingale, not Nightingale's groundbreaking book, Segregation, A Global History of Divided Cities, in which he traces the spread of segregationist urban policies from their beginnings in South Asia to what he calls a veritable segregationomania um, at the turn of the 20th century to arch segregationist policies in the United States and South Africa. A third approach that global urban history can build on is what I call cities in world history. These are encyclopedia-like collections that are composed of a series of studies 
on circumscribed urban contexts. Collectively, they add up to a panorama of cities around the world. And I think a, a good example for this approach is the Oxford Handbook of Cities in World History, which seeks to provide planetary coverage through chapters on cities in specific, specific world regions, and was published in 2013, as you can see. Now, in this, we find chapters um, on cities in different world regions, on certain types of cities, as well as on themes <coughs> in urban history. In the Oxford Handbook of Cities and World History, there are contributions on modern Latin America, Europe, the Middle East, or North America, along with chapters on migration, port cities, industrialization, uh, et, cetera, et cetera. Now, what matters here is, is kind of the structure, right? So we have the separation between European, North American, Middle Eastern, and Latin American. So we have kind of these compartments, neat compartments in which a uh, world history of cities is split up into. At the same time, we do have a planetary coverage that is reached through this kind of collective uh, adding of these different chapters. The point that I want to make here is that global urban history is not all new. I think that all of these three approaches provide critical insight that global urban history can expand upon. They share the intention to go beyond studies of individual cities and individual national contexts. In fact, we could conceptualize global urban history as a combination of all three of these different approaches. One way to define global urban history would be then to think of it as a large tent that offers room for comparative urban history, transnational urban history, and cities in the world history. However, Today, I want to suggest something else. I want to argue that global urban history should rather denote a field that also stands apart from these approaches. And this brings me to the question of the specificity uh, of global urban history. How can we say that global urban history is specific and uh, different? In order to illustrate this claim, the claim that global urban history can be distinct, I will expand on the meaning of global in global <coughs> urban history. If we conceptualize global urban history as a combination of urban history and global history, we also need to think about what constitutes global history. In his 2016 book, What is Global History? Sebastian Conrad offers eight methodological choices that allow us to think of global history as, dis as a distinct approach. Here, I only want to highlight four of them, since they can illustrate how global urban history can be thought of as being distinct from the approaches that I outlined. First, Conrad stresses that global history does not need to be the study of the whole world. <coughs> As a field, it is not limited to macro approaches, but it can also investigate how global processes interacted with dynamics in very small local contexts. When we think about the implications of this point for global urban history, it becomes clear that Global urban history does not have to be a history of cities around the world. To put it differently, global urban history is not an urban history with planetary coverage. Instead, global urban history can tie in with a longer tradition in urban history that Charles Tilley has highlighted in his essay, What Good is Urban History? And here I quote Tilley. Much of urban history's agenda deals implicitly or explicitly with the impact of global processes on small-scale social life, or, more rarely, 
the impact of small-scale social life on global processes. Secondly, Conrad points out that global history needs to include a critical self-reflection about Eurocentrism. This concerns a variety of dimension of writing, dimensions of writing history, from the analytical vocabulary that historians use to the grand narratives that they develop. For a global urban history, this implies a critical rethinking of some of the analytical concepts that historians have used in their studies of cities, including concepts such as the middle class, segregation, urbanization, or housemanization. Do these concepts simply transplant ideas about cities in Europe to other parts of the world? Or can they be kept as useful analytical categories? Moreover, Grand narratives such as urban modernity that place the Euro urban history of Europe and North America at the center of a seemingly universal historical process have to be revisited and reconsidered. How useful are these narratives when thinking about histories beyond Europe and North America? It is clear that this impetus makes global urban history distinct from the other three approaches that I outlined before. Comparative studies, transnational urban history, as well as cities and world history, all of these three approaches do not contain a call for a critical self-reflection about Eurocentrism. The third point that our Conrad raises is that global history is mainly concerned with the study of synchronous processes. Scholars in the field seek to understand how historical dynamics unfolded at the very same time. Global history is interested in parallels and ties between processes in geographically distant locations. For global urban history, this means that scholars will pay attention to the synchronous development of cities. Urban growth provides a useful example. Some comparative studies have drawn parallels between the growth of European cities in the 19th century <coughs> and the so-called megacities in the global south at the end of the 20th century. A global urban history would look at this differently. It would inquire how cities in Europe and what is today considered the global south already grew in a similar way during the 19th century. From this perspective, historians can study how cities like Cairo and Buenos Aires grew in a way that, in many respects, is comparable to the growth of Berlin and Manchester, for instance, between 1800 and 1900. Fourth, Sebastian Conrad argues that global history can trace causality up to the level of global integration. The emphasis here is on can rather than must. In global history, the issue of scale is inseparable from the question of causality. Like photographers, historians can zoom in and out of the context they study. And here we can also think of a famous uh, formulation by the French a historian, uh, Jacques Rebel, about microhistory, uh, which is the idea of the jeu d'échelle, uh, the plane with skates. So here, historians can look very closely, but they can also move up to a very high scale up to the global. If historians find proof that the pertinent causes for the phenomenon under study go beyond the nation state or region they're studying, they can trace these processes up to a larger scale. For global urban history, this means that historians need to ask whether the processes that they're interested in really stop at the city limits, the borders of the nation state, or the confines of a world region, or whether there are larger dynamics at play. This also entails 
that scholars have to read up on the history of cities beyond their area of specializations. They have to become familiar with the urban pasts of other world regions. Scholars of global urban history might ask questions like, can the phenomenon we observe be attributed to dynamics that lie outside the context we study? Can we observe similar processes or events in other cities? If so, can they be ascribed to similar causes? So far, my argument has been quite conceptual and, and abstract, and um, in the final part of this talk, I would therefore like to focus on a concrete example to illustrate some of the points that I tried to raise. Um, the example for this that I chose is the history of suburbs with a specific focus uh, on the history of Cairo. Suburbs are a prominent feature of 20th century urban history. Some have argued that suburbanization is one of the defining features of cities in this period. In fact, we can observe the spread of suburbs since the beginning of the 20th century in a variety of cities. We find the development of new neighborhoods that were built at a distance from older neighborhoods and that were connected to the city center by railway in a number of settings. You can think of New York, Berlin, but also Bombay, Cairo, and Tokyo. This spread of suburbs went far beyond historiographies that operate in national frameworks or are framed as European, North American, South Asian, or Middle Eastern. This observation reflects the interest of geographers today, like Roger Keel, who have worked on what they call global suburbs and it adds a historical dimension to these investigations. Now, how could we write such a history of suburbs as a global urban history? I will use the four methodological choices that I took from Sebastian Conrad's What is Global History and apply them to this case. Moreover, I will illustrate this approach by using the case of suburbs that were created in Cairo at the end of the 19th century. And uh, I'm not sure that the map is not very clear, but so I will mostly talk about two suburbs. Uh, one is the suburb of Penwen, which if you, if you follow the Nile, um, is actually beyond this map, but it's quite, it makes it quite clear that these neighborhoods were built outside of the urbanized uh, center of the city at the time, which as you see, along the Nile um, on the east bank of the Nile. Right, so Helwen is, is here, and uh, up here we find the second suburb, Heliopolis. For those of you uh, who have been to Cairo, this is very close uh, to where the International Airport is today. Um, so if you, if you drive from the airport into the city center, you will so as I mentioned, I want to think through these, these four methodological cho choices um, by drawing on the example of suburbs. The first methodological choice, if I can remind you, was that we don't need to focus on the entire planet. A global urban history of suburbs does not need to talk about suburbs everywhere in the world. It is just sufficient to think about a limited context to then move up in scale. Let's take the example of Cairo. Since the 1890s, the Egyptian capital saw the emergence of new neighborhoods at a distance from the city center that were connected to the city by railway lines such as Henwen and Heliopolis. Was this now a specifically Kyrene phenomenon? Not really. We see similar uh, dynamics in a city like Alexandria. Was this a specifically Middle Eastern phenomenon? No. The case of Cairo speaks as much to the spread of suburbs at the same time in Bombay as it does to the spread of suburbs in Berlin. Therefore, we 
can study the Kyrie cities <coughs> and think about it in conjuncture with developments in these other cities. Using sources on other places, or if this is not possible, using secondary literature. Yet we don't have to unearth the history of suburbs everywhere in the world. The second methodological choice. We need to think about challenges of Eurocentrism. There is, of course, the question of concepts and the term of the suburb itself. We have various other terms in other languages to talk about urban peripheries, such as the banlieue in French, or the favela in Portuguese, or the dahlia in Arabic. Now, does the term suburb risk to reduce these various concepts to a single term that mostly reflects an Anglo-American urban experience? In a fascinating recent volume, Charlotte Worms and Richard Harris have highlighted how rich different concepts of urban peripheries in various languages are once we look into multiple linguistic contexts. This is an issue that a global urban history needs to be highly sensitive to. Moreover, there's the issue of grand narratives. We can think of a history of suburbs as originating in the United Kingdom or in the United States and then spreading around the world in the form of copies of an original. One example that has often been referred to are garden city planning principles, reflected in entirely planned neighborhoods, small houses, and large green spaces. In the case of Cairo, historians have argued that these principles inspired the suburb of Heliopolis. But when we consider Arabic sources, we find numerous other references highlighting health concerns or the need to strengthen Egyptians' bodies through green spaces and sports that were widely circulated and discussed in Arabic periodicals at the time. Moreover, these neighborhoods differ in important respects from their counterparts in, for instance, uh, Great Britain. If we read suburbs through the lens of a British experience that's simply repeated in other parts of the world, we risk reproducing a colonial discourse of lack or not quite there yet. Um, and we can see this, this, the pitfalls of this Eurocentrism in a British guidebook about the suburb of Helouen uh, that was published in 1904. Just as an Illustration. So this is uh, this is kind of when we um, we see the, the villa type. We, we also can uh, see some of these, these green spaces. Uh, and in 1904, um, a British guidebook wrote about this scene. Quote: The moon has come up over the hills. The white stone of the flat-roofed houses by which you are immediately surrounded on all sides glistens in the soft light. They mostly belong to well-to-do pashas and Egyptians of position who use them as an Englishman would a suburban residence, except for the addition of the Hara. So in this way we see this, it is fairly suburban, but it's not quite, and then the, this extremely orientalist uh, reference uh, to the harem as the defining feature of the Orient and of the other. The third methodological choice that I mentioned was the need to think about the question of synchronicity. Many suburbs developed in various locales around the same time. They were coeval. A global urban history needs to first examine why it was that suburbs became such a widespread phenomenon at the time of the beginning of the 20th century, rather than think about where suburbs originated or how their development diverged. This was a moment of suburbs, and historians of global urban history will focus rather on space than time when investigating. The fourth choice that I mentioned, and the last one, is that we need to consider whether global integration matters for causality in this case. There are a number of developments that contributed to a circulation of knowledge about cities 
health issues as well as urban planning. Most importantly, at the time, we have media and the rise of international conferences um, and historians working on transnational exchanges between urban planning professionals during the first half of the 20th century uh, have, I think, well shown this point. We also see, when we think of a global structure, the importance of global capital for suburbs. In geographically distant places, suburbs were promoted by members of newly emerging middle classes, as global history has shown. Processes of class, class formation began to bridge distant contexts in the 19th century. Not least, these neighborhoods were in some cases even financed through capital um, by business people whose operations spread around the globe. One of the main uh, financiers behind the, the development of the suburb of Heliopolis in Cairo, for instance, was the Belgian tramway magnate Edouard Montan, who had built the Paris Metro tramways in China and Central Asia, as well as the Cairo tramway in 1896. He then went on to co-finance the suburb of Heliopolis together with an Egyptian business partner. This example, as well as the importance of global class formation, shows that historians need to consider how a new form of global capitalism helped to fuel the development of suburbs from Cairo to Mumbai to New York to Berlin. These were causalities that can hardly remain limited to a local or a national context. Now by showing these, uh, by showing how the four methodological choices can be applied to the history of suburbs, um, I hope to have illustrated how a global urban history might operate in practice. Now, where does this all leave us? Scholars use the term global urban history more and more frequently. If this tendency is to be more than a fashionable label that simply adds the adjective global to urban history, historians need to have a sustained and uh, also controversial discussion about what defines global urban history. With this talk, I hope to have clarified what I see as at least part of the answer to the question, what is global urban history? And I, and I hope that I managed to unpack this very short definition uh, that I provided uh, at the beginning. Most importantly, I think we need to take the connection of this field to global history more seriously. I have suggested that scholars in global urban history can draw on four methodological choices that highlight the difference of their approach to comparative urban history, transnational urban history, and cities in world history. Global urban history is not limited to macro approaches. Global urban history needs to address the challenge of Eurocentrism. Global urban history focuses on synchronicity. And fourth, global urban history traces causality up to global scale, uh, if we can. I see the global history of suburbs as one among many phenomena which historians could investigate in a new light by drawing on this approach. I hope that the example of suburb, suburbs has demonstrated such a global urban history, what such a global urban history could look like in practice. Of course, and this is very important, uh, not every history should or needs to be a global urban history. Quite the contrary. The historian Samuel Moyne has recently developed a fascinating argument about the, what he calls the non-globalization of ideas. <coughs> Thereby, he has drawn attention to the fact that some phenomena just don't travel. For various reasons, urban histories might be limited to a specific city. They might be limited to a specific nation state, and they might be limited to a specific world region. There might well be an urban history that is particular to the space that we call Europe, whatever the confines of this space might be. But the point here is that this specificity cannot simply be assumed, but it has to be shown. 
It needs to be demonstrated that certain characteristics of cities did not travel, but stayed within a given space. For this goal, global urban history appears, at least to me, as an apt partner of conversation for various other approaches to the history of cities, whether they're national, <coughs> regional, or very local. Last but not least, I should stress that this is, of course, very much an open and ongoing discussion. As I mentioned in the introduction, there are currently numerous articles, books, workshops, and conferences that serve as fora for historians uh, to debate what a global urban history can look like. Most importantly, there is the Global Urban History Project, or GUP, um, which you can find with this uh, uh, URL, www.globalurbanhistory.org. Um, this is um, a project created in 2017, which serve, serves as a platform for scholars interested in global urban history. GUP currently has around 450 members. Scholars post their profiles and list publications on the GOV website, uh, and you can search, one of the functions there is that you can search for collaborative partners and just, or just see what kind of publications in this field have been uh, produced. Through GOV, uh, scholars can also sign up for their monthly newsletter called Noteworthy in Global Urban History, um, and there are various uh, conference um, collaborations uh, that GOV is involved in. I, mentioned last year's conference, which was a collaboration um, with the Center for Urban History at the University of Leicester, uh, and now at the upcoming conference of the International Planning History Society in Moscow, GUP is also co-sponsoring um, some panels. Another forum that I would just want to briefly present is uh, a series that I just started co-editing with uh, my colleagues Michael Grubel and Tracy Newman. Um, a new series called The Cambridge Elements in Global Urban History, which is published by Cambridge University Press, and there will be around 40 contributions over the next five years, each in the form of a very short book. So the format is kind of between the format of an article and a book. Um, and we're very excited to find out what the contributors make um, of this field, we will have contributions on real estate, uh, the history of settler colonial cities, journalism in the city, a contribution on cities in the Atlantic world, et cetera, et cetera. So we're really looking forward to um, you know, what uh, historians who write in the series will make uh, of all of this. So I guess what, what I'm trying to say with this is that this is not just a conceptual and theoretical discussion, but very much a field that is developing and alive and uh, is being advanced by empirical studies. Um, and in this spirit of an ongoing conversation, uh, I would like to open the floor for questions and comments.